Rewind. Rewind. Kevin Brooks, make no mistake, he can fill it up. That's just six foot nine and handling the rock like that. That's NBA stuff. Nice crossover. Ooh, man, nice move. Got to the hole in a hurry. Some nice little moves there. 19 year old Steven Jackson gets to the cup. Shane Hill from way out. Shane Hill from the car park. It's a tough move. Just NBA 6'8 and a low post. Quick as you like. Just drove around Matt Nelson like he wasn't there. Do that quick spin to the base. Press we want, press we want, we want, we want, we want, we want. Hello, everybody, and welcome. It is NBL Rewind, hashtag NBL Rewind. And if you are joining us for the first time, firstly, geez, you've missed some good games. And secondly, if you haven't watched what the hell we're talking about each and every Thursday, jump on NBL, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, NBL TV, as we recount some of the classic games in the history of this great league. And then chat to a legend, which is the best way to describe our next guest. As I welcome you first, though, Liam Santa Maria. Hello to you. Hello, mate. This, uh, this is what I enjoy about NBL Rewind. We can go back and watch grand finals and massive games and, yep. uh, you know, overtime thrillers and whatnot. But I like also to go back and get a reminder about how good a guy was. Yes. NBL dropped the highlight reel a couple of days ago about a man here, silky smooth. And uh, this was a chance to watch a full 48 minutes of him doing his thing. Yeah, I know we talk about KB, Kevin Brooks. Uh, mate, welcome to NBL Rewind. Yeah, how you doing, boys? Good to be here, man. Tell you well, as Liam just touched on, not only the game we're about to touch a little bit on and, and your career, but the, the highlight reel. Man, it's so fun. To, it is just so fun to watch you. I, I, humility is something we don't have on NBL Rewind and KB. So straight up, man, if you want to brag about yourself, you should because everyone else does who comes on the <laughs> show. Man, your, your highlight reel, your game, it's so fun to watch. It must be so fun to reminisce when you sneak a peek at some of your old highlights. Yeah, look, that, that was good, man. Look, shout out to Statman for putting it together and everybody else involved. Um, I didn't know it was out there. I got some messages on Instagram and Facebook page, and, and, I, and I checked it out. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty cool, man. You know, you, wanna, you always want to look back at uh, the things you've done and with a little bit of a sense of pride. And uh, there were some good times I've had here in the NBA. It was the best basketball I've ever played in, in my career. And uh, especially here in LA, we won a couple of championships. So it was, it was good to watch. It's good to have some clips to show my young sons as well, because they're only five and two, and you know, daddy's daddy's moving a lot slower than he used to. So I got to show, I got stuff to show that I used to be okay back in the day. I used to move a little bit faster. Hey, Cam, we're we're gonna get into the game yeah. and, and everything, and the whole career and everything in a little bit. But right off the bat, KB. Watching that, that reel that they dropped the other night, um, you know, just the, the, you know, the buckets you're getting, but also the style that you had in your game. Very unique player to watch. Who did you grow up idolizing and watching that helped influence the type of baller that you became? Well, I'm a small town boy from Louisiana. We all had a, our local heroes. I had mine. You know, I had a guy uh, by the name of the Iceman, you know, a guy by the name of uh, Pops Landry. He was called him Spider-Man. There was Joe the Pro. There was all these local heroes, Shine, the Obear Boys. And I grew up idolizing these guys. And I think my game and the way I shoot the ball definitely came from, from Pops Landry. He was about a 6'5 point guard, long, lean, lanky player, very smooth. And uh, I enjoyed watching him play on the playground, and I really liked it. And I used to go out and emulate the way he shoot. And he used to cock the ball back as well. And, and that's kind of where my shot came from. Uh, but it just was um, just an interesting ride for me coming from that small town like that. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to, to get involved with the game, and I enjoyed it. I wasn't very good early on because I was so tall and so awkward until I would go one way, my legs would go the other way. So it took a while for my coordination to catch up. <laughs> but when it eventually did, um, at one time, it wasn't too cool to be the giraffe in the room. All of a sudden, it became cool to be tall. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, a few other things started to come with that. I started to really get into my basketball, and then it just took off from there. 
just just on that, I always find it interesting having a chat to, to pro athletes of any sport. At what at what age or a conversation or something that might have happened in a game did you think, you know what, I'm actually good at this and this could make me money while traveling around the world if obviously at the NBA in your backyard. But at what point did you know, I'm going to try and make this a career rather than a hobby on the weekends? Boy, that happened much, much later for me. I mean, look, much props to those people who say, look, I always wanted to be an NBA player or always wanted to be a professional soccer player, footy player. I just wasn't one of those guys. I just was a young kid. I grew up in the country. I grew up fishing and, and just doing things that kids do, playing ball, playing sports. And um, I just wasn't very good. I was a late bloomer. And uh, probably around year eight, I started to I took, kind of join the junior varsity team. And, you know, I kind of stuck with it. I started to get a bit of attention. Most of the people tell me, hey, man, you're so tall, you should play. You should play. And eventually I did. Um, and then, as, you know, I had some good coaches in high school, so I started to get better. I started to enjoy the game, have fun with it. And, but it wasn't until college, mm -hmm. probably, you know, my, my uh, junior to senior year, where I actually thought that uh, I may have a chance to play professionally because other than that, I was just competing and playing. And I mm -hmm. think for me, actually, it was a good thing. These days, some of the young players can probably get a little bit ahead of themselves and looking too far down the line. And because I didn't really think that was an option, I just stayed where I was and just kept stayed in the moment and kept playing and working and, and trying to get better at different things. And, and that was the pathway for me, and that's the way it worked out. So uh, it was quite a while before I thought I could be a pro. Well, just on that, and we see, of course, a much different collegiate world, one and dones and all the rest of it nowadays, but... If you're getting towards your senior year and you weren't yet in that, hey, I'm going to be a pro, what, what, what did you major in? What did you think you were going to do once you finished college? Like, did you have something, you know, a non-basketball, non-sport related uh, occupation in mind? You know, man, I don't know, man. You know, it was, it was scary. I can remember back in high school, man, growing up, my grandmother, right? When she said, uh, you know, when you finish high school, she said, you know, you can't stay here anymore. And I said, what do you mean I can't stay here anymore? This is my home. She said, no, you can't stay anymore. You got to get out of here. You got to go and be a man. So whether that means you go to the Army or you go get a job or you go to college. Now, that scared the shit out of me, mm. right? That scared the shit out of me because I had no idea. So when I got to college, I was like, okay, I studied. I majored in business administration. I was like, okay, you know, I'm looking at other people. You go get a job. You know, you make, and it's funny, too, because you get a job, you make 30, 35,000. You're the man. <laughs> right, coming out of college, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, I get drafted, I go to the pros, and I'm making over six hundred and some thousand dollars a year. I mean, I'm like, uh, this, you know, you're making more than your parents and your, your buddy's parents and your whole family maybe put together. It's it's crazy. So I I don't get that far down the line, boys. I just, you know, I played, I played, I played, and if I didn't, if I wasn't drafted or if I didn't become a pro, I would have went back to college. I would have finished my degree then and there. And then after that, I would have tried to do what most of the people do, get a job and, and live your life. So sounds pretty boring now when you think about it, but I mean, that, that's what I would have done. You know what? Living in the moment is some of the best, I think, advice, Liam, you can actually give nowadays. So not just as, as athletes, but as anyone, everyone, and you know, probably ourselves included at some point, always worried about something in the future rather than appreciating what is happening at the moment. So that's, that's damn good advice, KB. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, look, man, I mean, it's, I mean, that's real. That's the way it mm -hmm. was for me. Um, some people are able to project down there and visualize themselves being in a certain situation. And we all know that they actually teach that now. You need to see yourself being a pro one day. And, and I think that works. I think it works. But for me at that time, I just was unaware of that type of technique. I just stayed in the moment and just tried to get better. And, and just see where it takes me. And it took me a long way. Were, were you at the same school as Sean Long? Have I got that right? Sean Long was at the same school that I went to. <laughs> <laughs> Rephrase that a little bit, right? Yeah, I get you. <laughs> I get you. Okay. Did you, um, did you, yeah, did you, you have a soft spot for him in the league? Huh? Did you have a soft spot for him in the league in the last couple Absolutely. of years? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only did he attend um, uh, the university, um, well, it's called University of Louisiana now. It was University of Southwestern when I was there. Right. And uh, But he's also a homeboy, man. He's from Louisiana. Yep. 
Okay, so um, definitely got much love for him and all the brothers who come out of the state. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal when somebody comes out of your home uh, state or your hometown like that. So um, I approached him one day. I think we had just played New Zealand. Uh, we would have been a couple seasons ago. We was in the airport heading back. And um, I went over and said hello to him and had a nice little chat with him. And then, uh, you know, I said to him, hey, man, I, I heard that you might have broke my record or something. He said, yeah, I broke all your records. I broke all your records. <laughs> oh, he was talking smack right away, right? So I still don't know if it's true. I got to call back home and find out if this dude actually broke my record, which I'm not going to be happy about. I have to right. say, I'm not be happy about it. But he had an unbelievable career. He had a great college career, over 2,000 points. And I was over 2,000 points and 700 rebounds. I think he's over 2,000 points and 1,000 rebounds. Right. But he's got me on the rebounds. As long as he doesn't have me on the scoring, I'm okay. <laughs> he got me on the scoring, then I'm going to be a bit salty. I'm going to be a bit well, salty. And then he, he came into Adelaide and gave you guys some problems mm. as, a, as a breaker in particular. As a breaker, he gave us the business. He was talking smack. Yeah. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? And then yeah. I, he might have been uh, one of the players or someone say, man, he came from your school. And right then I said, okay, I softened up a little bit towards him. Oh, right. And then yeah. I found out he was from Louisiana. I had to Google him and check him out. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but he put in work. He's, uh, he actually got some NBA time as well. Um, from what I understand, I talked to his college coach, who's there now. And uh, he has nothing but great things to say about Sean. And so um, I think he's an asset to the league, man. He's a legitimate big man. It's funny how the big man has come back to the league over the last mm. few seasons, right? You know, and that's good to see that the big guy is still out there. Mm. He's, uh, he's headed off to Korea now for next season. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yes, sir. When did this take place? A little while ago. Mm. Yeah, You've been well, busy running I'm the business. Busy. Yeah. I'm running the business. I'm not connected, man, but I am surprised about that career. Good gravy. Yeah. Any tall players in career? Yeah, I, got, I hope there's a few tall players over there to give them a bit of a challenge, but I think they do pay well over there, don't they? Yeah, so I, I think right. he's going to uh, get a little bit of cabbage over there. Well, all the best to him. Uh, hopefully, he might come back and, and – uh, you know, graces with his presence and his talents and skills one day, but uh, for the last couple of seasons, he played well. You, you talk about uh, him as an NBA player. Let's talk about you as an NBA player. Pick 18 in the 91 NBA draft. Uh, drafted by, was it drafted by Milwaukee? Milwaukee. Traded to Denver. What do, you, what do you remember about draft night and that whole process? Draft night was exciting, man. I drove up to Houston from Louisiana about three hours to my mom's place. Um, I had guys like Chris Gatlin, who I knew, um, who was asking me to fly up to New York because they was having all these crazy parties. Larry Johnson was having this crazy party. And he was like, man, you got to come up to New York, man. You know, we have parties all week before the draft. And I'm a country boy, boys. I'm, I'm like, man, I'm not going to New York. I don't want to be one of those guys sitting in that seat on TV and they don't call your name. And you just sit there and you sit there and he says, I say, no way. I, I, I kept it real. I stayed home with my ex-girlfriend at that time. Um, and uh, my girlfriend at that time and my mom, a local TV crew came up. Uh, my agent went to New York. I had workouts for Milwaukee. I had a very good workout with Milwaukee with George Eccles. I don't remember George Eccles from UNLV, mm -hmm. the big guy. Mm -hmm. I had, um, I worked out for the Atlanta Hawks. I worked out for Phil Jackson, Chicago Bulls. I worked out, which is a great story about that. Jerry Krause was, was a guy who really liked me a lot. Um, I worked out. I had an interview with Boston. They didn't do workouts. They done, they done interviews. That's where I met Rick Fox. I saw Rick Fox, man. He had, like, the biggest head I've ever seen on a human, man. His head is massive, right? So I saw Rick Fox walking down the aisle. I'm like, shit. You know, and... Uh, I think I had a workout for someone else I can't remember, but my agent said, hey, look, I'll call you because I'll probably know where you're going to go before you get called. I said, okay, cool. So I'm sitting at home, chilling, chilling, chilling. Boom, the phone rings. My agent's on the line. I said, hey, you're about to get drafted. Number 19. Who's that, number 19? 
Yes, to the, who had the 19 pick boys? I think it might have been the Washington Bullets. I'll find out for you. Who was the 19 pick? I think it, it might was, have been. It was Washington. They took LeBradford Smith. They took LeBradford. They took my boy LeBradford. So uh, he said, hey, you're going to be drafted 19 in Washington. I said, okay, cool. So the time we, we're talking, all of a sudden, I hear some screaming and yelling. My, my mom, my girlfriend, they're watching the TV. I just got drafted 18. So I look around to see what's going on. It's like, you, get, you know, you just got drafted. And I call my agent, Big Dad. I say, Yo, Big Dad, I just got drafted, man. What are you talking about? I just got drafted. Right? I'm 18. And it made sense because I had such a great workout for Milwaukee. Right. So, boom, I got drafted to Milwaukee Bucks. And so he looked up at the big screen. He's like, oh, shit. Yeah, you did. Congratulations. Right? So we had a bit of celebration there, yada, yada, yada. And so I uh, got off the phone with my agent. We're just kind of chilling. Camera crew from, from USL came up from Lafayette. So they filmed a little bit. And it was cool, man. It was, it was awesome. And then all of a sudden, I got the phone ring again, like five minutes later. And I just got traded. So my agent said, you just got traded. I'm like, traded? <laughs> traded? <laughs> what do you mean traded? Traded to who? Traded why? Why did I get traded? What did I do? You know, I had no clue what was going on, man. So I was very nervous. I was disappointed. Really? I like, man. Oh, I was real disappointed because I didn't understand the process then. So I was like. You thought they, did, they didn't want me. I've done something wrong. Want, that's exactly what I said. I said, they didn't want me. I said, why didn't they want me, man? I had such a great workout. And, and then he said, well, you've been traded to Denver. I was like, Denver? I didn't work out for Denver. You know, I, I was like, what the hell is Denver? Who's it? I had nothing, man. And so I think he could hear it in my voice. And he's like, look, I'll find out all the details later. But right now, you're going to Denver. I'll give you a call back. But understand something. You're the 18th pick in the draft. No matter yeah. where you end up, you're going to be the 18th pick in the draft. You're going to get paid as the 18th pick in the draft. And so, look, we're, we're figuring everything out, but you're good. So that kind of settled me down a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I told my, my family and everything, and they were, you know, they were a little bit, they didn't quite understand what was going on either. But it was, um, it was quite a surreal moment. Uh, it, it was exciting, and then I was down in the dumps, and I was excited again. So I was all over the shop that day, all over the shop. You said you didn't go to New York because you thought there's a chance you might not get drafted. You end up being almost a lottery pick. Like, you legit thought you might not get picked? Well, you know, my agent told me that, look, you're projected to be anywhere from probably middle to late first round draft pick. But you know, on draft day, man, these cats are willing and dealing. Anything can happen. Mm. You can be middle draft pick and you end up mm. last pick of the second round. You just never know. And we've all seen drafts in the past where there's one or two guys there sitting in their suit in New York and they just sit there. And, you, and I remember as a kid watching, like, man, I, I don't want to be that guy. I wouldn't want to be that guy. Because I can, you know, you got the cameras always in your face. And right. you're like, you got to maintain your self-control and your emotions. Now, some guys have used that in their favor. Some guys have come from that and say, okay, you know what? With that chip on their shoulder, I'm going to show you, you know. Um, who was that, man? Was Eldon Campbell there a little bit longer back in the day? Eldon Campbell that played at um, Eldon Campbell played for the Lakers a long time. He might have came out of Clemson or something. Um, and it was um, who else was there? It was quite a few players that over the years you see. And I just didn't want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw, you know what? I'm gonna play it safe. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep it real with my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever happens, happens. So uh, in hindsight, I thought about, you know, if I was in New York, the hell would be awesome then. <laughs> but, <laughs> grandma you know, and, oh, man. Yeah. You know, Grandma Ma was throwing crazy. He threw a crazy party before the draft. Imagine after the draft, he was the number one pick. The only guy who was pissed off about that was Matumbo. So Matumbo wasn't happy because he wanted to be the number one pick. So every time we played Grandma Ma with the Hornets, Matumbo tried to block everything. Huh. Everything. He walked in there talking about new grandma mom. I got something for grandma mom. He, he was pissed off every time we played him. That's great. You ended up on a, on a really cool, young, fun to watch team as well. And of course, that 94 plus, which we'll get to in a second. But when you did get to Denver, 
how enjoyable was it? Once you sort of were able to work out what the process meant and where you ended up, you know, and, and the young yeah. crew that you had as well. The, yeah, it was, was like? uh, you know, it was, it, it was exciting, man. You know, I bought my first, my first vehicle that I bought for me. And then uh, I ended up flying to Denver. And I had my uncle drive the, cut, the truck up. You know, you got to find a place to stay. You know, you find out where trainings are. You want to kind of stay pretty close. And it was all new and exciting for me. I was by myself there. And all of a sudden, you meet the new players coming in. Matumbo was drafted that year. Mark Macon out of Temple was there. Um, and then you meet your teammates already there. Chris Jackson, mm -hmm. later changed his name to Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf, played at LSU. But I had never met him until then. Uh, Marcus Liberty was there. Reggie Williams from Georgetown was there. So him and Matumbo clicked right away to Georgetown boys. Um, you know, Tommy Hammonds and uh, who else was there? Um, following year, Brian Stitt, LaFonso Ellis came in the following year. And then Donnell Me, Rodney Rogers came in the third year. But, you know, there's a bunch of young guys who were young. Dan this was a first year coach. And uh, when I first got to Denver and started working out, I hated it. Absolutely hated it. The altitude was terrible. I'm from the low sea level in Louisiana, and all of a sudden I go to the Mile High City, and a couple trips down the court, you feel like your chest is about to explode. It was no fun. I was nauseous all the time. And I remember we had our training camp before we went to Utah for the Utah pre, what they used to call it, the Utah, just a preseason review, I think they used to call it. And when I got to Utah, we were a little bit, Lower, so I, I kind of settled down a bit there. And I remember guys playing there, all the uh, guys who have been drafted, Spreewell, and all the guys, Galley, and Victor, and Sean, and all those guys. So all that was cool. Uh, once I got settled in there and I got acclimated, then um, it was then it was about trying to establish yourself and learn what the professional game was about. And uh, you learn a lot from your veteran players. Western Garden was there, of course, Reggie Williams, those guys. And, you know, you got your rookie duties and everything to do, but you're trying to learn from these older guys and figure out, hey, man, how can I learn this game and how can I have a long career in the NBA? Mm. Uh, let's fast forward to 94. Cam mm. talked about uh, that season, that playoff series. Everyone uh, our age remembers the We Believe Warriors. Right, and yeah. but you yeah. guys were, you know, let's take it back. I mean, you guys were the first number eight seed to topple uh, a number one seed when you when you got the better of the Supersonics. Down 0-2 in that series. Take us into that locker room or that bus or that flight in that moment of that historic series. You know, it was, it was our first time there. You know, first time coach, they coaching Dan Nessel, who had great staff there with Gene Littles and Mike Evans. And, and um, you know, we were very young and, and up and down as a young team would be. We played to the level of our competition. We played the Bulls, we played hard and tough. We played a team like the Clippers at that time of, you know, we probably play even, you know, we play worse. So that's what young teams do, unfortunately. But we went down 0 2, and we normally were pretty tough at home. But, boom, they got us at home, right? No, 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 no. They got us first two games. Both in Seattle. Yeah. So, when we went back home, we always played well at home. We're back in front of our fans, our families, and everything. And also, because we were down, too, we had, like, nothing to lose type of mentality. And that's what Dan was talking about. Look, we might as well go out here and just play our butts off. We got nothing to lose. We're down on two. No one expected anything. And on top of that, we actually just making the playoffs was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was such a young team, Mount Matumbo, and just building the pieces around Matumbo. You know what I mean? And by that time, making and Liberty Potter were traded to Detroit by then. So, uh, you know, Reggie was still there. Robert Packett came on maybe a year or so before that. Him and Mike Moon had the point guard position. Brian Stitt had that two guard. He had Reggie Williams. <coughs> You have Alfonso Ellis, Tommy Hammonds. You have Matumbo at the five. So all of a sudden, you, you, know, you got some pieces to work with there. And a few other guys, of course, filled it out. And we came out there, and we got a game off of them. And these guys that we saw a lot. We saw a lot of stuff. Mm. We saw them in our sleep. 
you know, pick and roll, bounce pass. You know what I mean? We saw that shit in our sleep. We played them so many times. But we got them, right? All of a sudden, we feel good. We took a game. Everyone expected us to be like, okay, well, that's that. They get one game. Next thing you know, we win another game. Now, all of a sudden, we get our tails up, right? We get our tails up. We start to believe a little bit. We start to say, you know, what if, you know? And at that particular time, it was about, look, we got to put better pressure on the ball. Stockton's tough as nails, but you got to be physical with him. You got Hornacek. We can't give him open looks. The guy shoots the ball like layups, you know? Oh, hold on, hold on. Isn't this Peyton and Kemp? What's that? Are we talking about Peyton and Kemp? Hold on, what are we talking about? The Seattle series when you uh, knocked 8v1. Oh, man, I'm already on the second round. Come <laughs> on, man. <laughs> well, let's talk about the series where oh. Matumbo <laughs> ends up on the floor yeah. with that's, the ball. That's, that's the first one. Okay, I'm sorry, man, I'm gone, man. We talk that's about the glove. One. That's we the talk one. That's the glove and green man. That's yeah. what we're talking about. Yes. Oh, man, we're talking about. Gary Payton, boy, he used to talk some shit. And <laughs> Sean Kemp was just a freak. They had Kendall Gill. They had, um, yeah. oh, I can see his face. He, he's a coach now. He's a head coach. Oh, man. George you know, Nate McMillan? Nate McMillan. Nate was tough, right? Nate was tough. Vincent Askew was coming off the bench. They had some other guys down there. And um, so, yeah, I got ahead of myself. How did I get to Utah? Yeah, so anyway, said- so they're the top seed, and they got you down two zip. How come you guys didn't just fall? Well, basically what I said earlier. <laughs> Still stands. We had nothing to lose. We had right. nothing to lose, right? And we did have some good matchups against Seattle throughout the course of the year. Right. So we had some – I can't remember if we had to beat them or not, but we, we matched up well against them. But the thing was we needed to make Gary shoot the ball – you know, we had to do our job on Kendall Gill, who was tough at that time. Back mm-hmm. then. They were the but we had to funnel those guys into the big fella. We had to make them deal with the big fella and then be able to rebound after that. Now, we all know that big fella had Sean Kemp in his pocket that whole series, right? So they came up, boom, they gave it to us. Because they were the best team in the league at that team, right? Mm-hmm. At that yeah. time, boom, they gave it to us. Boom, they gave it to us. Then they came down to McNichols Arena in Denver. And we took that one game off of him. But Tumbo was swatting shit like flies, man. He was swatting it. And then all of a sudden, psychologically, he got in Kemp's head. So, because Matumbo was so long that you could beat him and get by him, and he kept coming and you blocked the shot from behind. So all of a sudden, he started getting Kemp's head a little bit, which was a big part of what they do. Mm. After that, boom, we got the next game. We got another game off of him. Everything changes. Mm-hmm. Tails up. All of a sudden, what if started to creep into the Seattle camp? George Carr is pissed off as all hell. He is cursing his players out. He's going off on them, right? And now we go back to Seattle. Now we don't supposed to be going back there. Mm-hmm. All the pressure is firmly on them boys. They're the number one seed. There's nothing on us. And this is what we've talked about in our locker room. We need to just go out and play. Okay, there's no pressure on us. We've already uh, overachieved by making the playoffs. We've overachieved by taking these guys to five games. We just got to go out there and do the thing that we do. Put pressure on the ball, funnel it to Matumbo, rebound the ball, run, right? Now, there's another guy I failed to mention on that team who you guys know the story. He passed away some years ago. The last time I actually saw him was in Australia in Perth, and that's Brian Williams. You remember Brian Williams? Mm-hmm. Played on Chicago team. Big he boy. had a monster series. He had a monster series mm. as well. Long arms. He was on that team, lefty, right, out of Arizona. So, man, we were balling. We were balling. And all of a sudden, that Sean Kemp became a non-factor because he wasn't shooting the ball from the perimeter very well, but he can do other things, play above the rim. He can get by. He can, he can embarrass him. You know, Rayman mm-hmm. can embarrass him. From a tumble had it. You could see it in his body language. He didn't want to take, he couldn't beat him. And all of a sudden the game changed. All right. Now Kendall Gill stepped up in game five. 
Kendall Gill stepped up, and he was a two-way player, very good two-way player. Mm. And he kept them going, he kept them alive. But the next thing you know, Matumbo's sitting there with his mouth wide open, holding the ball on the ground, and we had done the impossible. I can still remember the highlights when Charles Barkley was running down the aisle, screaming at the Nuggets beat Seattle, the Nuggets beat Seattle, because he was over there in Phoenix, I think. And uh, he was so excited about it because they were the number one team in the country at that time. So, yeah, yeah it was exciting. Man. man, I can't believe I got ahead of myself. <laughs> well, well, let's go back there because you did play Utah Jazz really tough as well. Like, you, almost the exact same start to the series, seven-game series, so a little longer. But, you know, talk us through that series as well because, you know, Utah was so successful at the time. Yeah, Utah worked. And, and you know, the Stockton Malone deal, the legendary coach Jerry Sloan, uh, they had check, shoot the ball. They had a nice team. They had a very, very nice team there. And it was pretty much the same situation. We went down to, all of a sudden we came back. Now, what was it back then? Was it, it wasn't 2-2-1-1-1, two, two, one, 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 was it? Was it 2-3-2? Two, two? It was 2-3-2 two, two two back then, yeah. It was 2-3-2. Two, two. Hmm. Okay. So they won the first two. Then we won what? We won a couple. And... I think we just won all our home games. We didn't go up 3-2. No, nah, I think you might have dropped a home game and uh, went back to Utah down 3-2. I haven't got it in front of me. I'm just going through memory here. But I think you were 3-2 down when you went back for game six. We won a game in Utah. Oh, my. Now, you guys remember the only speed, Larry Miller, the late Larry Miller. I think mm-hmm. his wife is still there now. And the Miller family owns, owns the Jazz. He was a fiery coach. A fiery owner. Fiery owner, man. And um, he was, boy, he was beat red when we won that game. Because no one expected us to win that game, especially on the home court. Um, same situation with Seattle, but over seven games. All of a sudden, we got our confidence. We started to believe. We started to say, what if all the pressure was on Utah? You could start to see it in Utah, in their players, on the court, their execution, their body language. Um, but Tumbo and, 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 B, and uh, B. Williams had monster games again. And I don't know if you guys remember game seven, but we came really close to beating mm. them in game seven. Mm. Very, very close. It was, a, it was a key play, I think, down the stretch with uh, maybe with Brian Williams that really could have turned the, uh, the tide for us, but it went down to the end. You know, now that game was quite significant for us because all throughout the year, Lafonso Ellis hero was Carl Malone. That was his hero. And so he struggled to play against Carl Malone from the first time he was in the league. And so Dan used to talk to him about it and, you know, used to do some things and and try to help him overcome it. But he just, he he couldn't attack and be aggressive against his childhood hero. Mm -hmm. And of course, Malone would just give it to him. But eventually, Fon started to come around a little bit. And uh, he started to be a bit aggressive and started to attack him. And so I think he ended up playing. I think he ended up playing okay for that series. But, uh, you know, our guards, Pac-Man was always aggressive. Chris Jackson, man, was well, my boot at that time could just light you up at any time. We had Brian Stitt. We had guys who come in and you bring it there. So that was just a matter of believing. Well, all of a sudden, we knocked off the number one team. So why can't we beat Utah? We took them to game seven, and I think the game was probably decided in the, in the end of the uh, towards the fourth quarter because we were right there all the way. I'll tell you this, KB, I, and this is what NBL Rewind does so well. I know this is an NBL, but this is the series. You lost the first two games. You lost game three at home in overtime. Carl Malone hits a game winner. You win oh. game four. Reggie Williams hits a game winner pretty much on the buzzer. Game five goes to double overtime. You go to game six in Utah, win that game by three and become the first team in 40 years to force a game seven after being down zip three. And then game seven, uh, you went down by 10, but we're in it in the last couple of minutes as you touched on. So this, this is what these times are doing. They're, they're, they're forcing us to go back and look at some stuff and, and remember amazing series. And what a what if game that game seven yeah. is. Imagine if you, after toppling the Sonics in five, coming back from 0-2. Oh. If you had a got that game seven in the gone of the conference finals after being down 0-3, that would have just been incredible. Hey, let me tell you, that's just great. Overtime, double overtime, man. You know, I remember, I remember that now, man. 
I remember that day. I admit, my Nichols Arena was rocking, man. Oof. It was rocking, man. It was, it was not an easy play to play, a uh, place to play for our position. Akeem Olajuwon hated it when he played the Rockets because of the altitude. He always had, uh, always had air on the sideline. But that place was rocking, um, and we would have. You know who ended up? I'm going to give you guys some trivia. Who ended up surpassing us? We were the first eight seed to knock off a number one seed, and then some years after that, a team surpassed us and became done the same thing and did more. Well, that would have been Springwell's next, right? Hey, Grandmama. Yeah. Yeah. In the you lockout, are, yeah. You guys are on it. Uh, they ended up becoming the first eight seed to go all the way to the finals. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching it, I was a little bit pissed off too because I wanted us to hold that record for a little bit longer. <laughs> It's but an asterisk. Have... It's an asterisk, though. <laughs> oh, no. There's a lockout. Well, is that because of the short season? There's a lockout, lockout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, but you hey, know but... what? Hey, Gazy got his ring. Hey. Oh. <laughs> Andrew Gaze, when he's at the Spurs, because yes, he played he for the Spurs, and they then, of course, beat New York. All right. Let's, let's fast forward. Oh, sorry, yeah, Liam. Let's go. do that. Yeah. Just gonna, let's fast forward, because let's get to Adelaide and, and how you ended up there. Well, and, oh. the, Darnell Meek, right? Yeah. Give us, oh, I mean, give us that phone call. My teammate in Denver. We uh, end up. I end up signing with his agent. Huh. I end up signing with his agent uh, later on, and uh, he came out and played for the Canberra Cannons with the great Rob Rose, right? And so I was playing. I don't know where I was. I could have been in uh, Argentina, Argentina. Or somewhere. Uh, and he called me and said, "Look, man, you need to come down here. It's a good league. It's good competition." At that time, boys, was it 12 or 14 teams in the NBL at that time? How many teams were in the NBL? Uh, it had to be at least 12. Right? Yeah, there would have been at least 12. There was obviously the change. That 96 season, we did see, I think, three drop out. And then, yeah. yeah. We'll, say, we'll say minimum 12. I'm with you there. Yeah, I think it was a minimum of 12 teams. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, look, you travel everywhere. You know, you fly, you stay in it nice. He said, there's nothing like the NBA, right? But he said... It's English speaking, because we both had had experience in Europe, and Europe, mm -hmm. is, Europe can be tough. Europe can be tough. You know, you're training twice a day for eight to 10 months. You know, you don't always get the money. You know, it's like, look, whatever you sign for Australia, you're going to get your money. And uh, at that time, I had experienced uh, some setbacks in Europe and Argentina in regards to money. So I, I was like, okay, you know, chance to reunite with my teammate. So that's how I ended up here. Phil Smite became the head coach. So Phil organized a workout with a guy, well, but I can see his face. He's an NBA assistant coach. At that time, he was with the Clippers as a young assistant to work me and Jeff Webster from Oklahoma out. And I think Jeff ended up playing in the league later on in the NBA. And so I wasn't too happy with Phil because I was like, I thought because of my resume, man, why do I need to work it out? You know, I I should get the job, man. What's going on? So mm -hmm. I give him shit about that even to this day that he made me work out. <laughs> but I got a lot of respect for him because, you know, he done that. Hey, he's a first-year coach. I got to get this right. Right. And so I worked out. Jeff and I worked out. I ended up beating out Jeff. And I ended up signing with Adelaide. And I got the job. So I arrived over here in, in January 98. And that's how I ended up with the Sixers. And right, you got to work. Yeah, you did. And, and early. Because this game that uh, is really the, the centerpiece of NBL Rewind tonight is that Adelaide v. Sydney game. Uh, yes. That was, I think, your fourth game. Gave us 28 and 15, KB. Do you remember this game at all? Because there's a couple of notable things that come out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, I remember a little bit about that game. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a little bit there, I remember. Um, but... Um, what year was that? That was, that was 98 that year? This is 98. Your fourth game in the league. There's yeah. a lot of interesting elements to this game. It's mm -hmm. so fun to go back and watch. You know, you see um, Hammer running the show for the, for the Kings. This is Stephen Jackson's last game in the NBL. Yeah. yeah. Court. We'll get to that in a minute. They've got Matt Nova. Is there other import? Ricky Rowe from Blue Chips. Yes. <laughs> Just can't get it going at all for the, for the Kings. Didn't last long. Um, yes. For you guys, it was the start obviously, of a really special season. It was. And it was. And we could have kept that team together, boys. We probably could have, could have done something even, even more special. But um, 
Donnell and I didn't have the NBA careers we wanted, right? So uh, we went, we played Europe, we kept working, we done what we had to do. So when we came to Adelaide, at that time, we probably were a bit over ourselves. You know, that's the term that Popovich liked to use yep. for his players. Like, we want guys who are a bit over themselves. Well, at that time, we had been through some things. We were over ourselves. We wanted to work. We wanted to make a little bit of money. But we really wanted to play good basketball and enjoy our basketball. So when we got there, it wasn't about being the man. It was about being one of the men sort of thing. And we came into that situation with Phil, who played the game, had a totally different philosophy about the game, with just allowing players to play very little structure so we were almost unscoutable to a certain degree because we wasn't running uh, continuity or motion every single mm. time you know we'll come down a few passes cut through and then break you down off the dribble get you in rotations and play out of that we see a lot of it now they probably call it the dribble drive or you know dribble, dribble drive and kick or whatever but you know we walked in that locker room man and and right away that was that was just shit talking right away. Like when we first walked in the locker room, and Mark Davis was there, and John Riley, and Brett Maher, and Catalini, and Paul Reese, and all these guys were there. It's just we walked in, and, and, and you, know, like you guys said, taking the piss. We, we were just doing it from the very beginning. I walked in and looked at John Riley, and I was like, man, I look like the guy from Powder, the movie Powder, right? <laughs> and so everybody. Everybody bust out laughing when I said that, and that kind of broke the ice. And after that, boy, it was just a slaughter. In there. We were just going at it and laughing and having fun. So we clicked right away. And then I think um, I remember Pat Reedy, man, a great, great player, great footwork. Reedy said, he remember early on, he said something about, man, they play together like they've been, they play like they've been playing together for years. Right. You know, and I thought that was an interesting thing. Uh, and, and quite a compliment because we just clicked. And our trainings were different. There wasn't a lot of drills in our training, boys. You know, we warmed up. You should have seen our warm-ups. It was just like a Harlem Globetrotter show. <laughs> we warmed up for five minutes. We throwing shit over our heads. We throwing, <laughs> up. We throwing that right. Still sitting up there, just chill, you know, you have to laugh. And then when it was time to train, it was time to train. Okay. Flick the switch. And then all of a sudden, we get up and out. Everything was competitive. Every drill, every shooting drill, every one on one, every two on one, every two on two, five on five. And we played a lot. So we developed that chemistry real early because we played a lot of games. We scrimmaged a lot. So all of a sudden, we started to figure each other out. Now, I was playing a four position, I was really a three. You know, I was a three two in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Okay, now all of a sudden, I'm playing the four position. I'm really a small forward. So that, I don't know if there was a stretch four. I don't know if that term was used before. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, that's what I was. So we got me at the three. We got Catalini. We got Mozzie. We got uh, Darnell. Really was good enough to start. He came off the bench. But we got four guys who could shoot the three and take you off the dribble. Mm -hmm. We got Paul Reese, who was back there yelling and screaming and setting screens and doing all the things you want your big guy to do. He was intangible for us, right? We got Mark Davis come off the bench, right? And if we needed more physicality right away, we could, we could just run a guy into Mark and it's like running him into a damn wall. <laughs> Hoodie was going to come out there and do what he does, rebound and be physical and hit guys. And really came off as another threat. And all of a sudden, boom, it just clicked, man. It just clicked, and we were just having fun and enjoying it. Gorgeous teams were the team to beat. Mm -hmm. They were projected champions, so there was no pressure on us whatsoever but to do anything but stay true to one another. Uh, we shared the ball well. We passed around, and, uh, and everybody got a chance to just do what, they, do what they do. So it didn't really matter who got the credit. And you know what? That's hard to replicate. Mm. It's hard to replicate that. And so I think that's a testament to Phil and their state of coaching staff, but also the players, where we kind of look for one another and we just bought into it. Um, there's one thing we've got to touch on, Cam, before we move off of this game. I agree. Because it's a big moment. Huge. So it's a bit, I think you know where we're going here, KB. Because <laughs> you got a little flat tire and you yeah. robbed John really of perhaps one of the greatest assists in NBA history. It's the play that Steven Jackson ended up breaking his foot, interestingly enough. 
Arilla really yeah. comes into the lane, spins, finds you over his head. And for some reason, you rammed that thing right into the front of the rim. Out of all the highlights, how do you guys find these highlights? <laughs> I got to call Stack Man. I got to call Shout Stack Man. Shout out to the slow commotion. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. What? You know Come what? Come on, man. I don't know what happened there, man. I mean, the pass came. I think I got caught in two minds of what I was going to do, like how I was going to dunk it. <laughs> I was going to dunk it with one hand or two hands, and then I ended up doing neither. So it was, <laughs> it was, it was a bit of an embarrassing type of moment, uh, and really was just dumbfounded. Really, was like, what are you doing? Really, nobody's sweet path, and I wanted to hammer it down. And did I actually just miss the dunk in the back, or did I get hung? I got hung on the front of the rim. Front of the rim. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's real bad. Yeah, that's, See, that's because bad. you know, uh, remember Josh Boone with the Lamelo ball pass this year? You know, yes. shades off. Yes. But did he get hung or did he miss the dunk on the back? Nah, he lost the the ball slipped out of his yeah, hand. Yeah. And, yeah. I just, think mine might have been worse than that. <laughs> I think mine was worse than that. Because you know what? Getting hung on the front of the rim, that's what you used to do in high school. Like when you just started off, you try to dunk. Mm -hmm. And you get hung on the front of the rim, land flat on your back in front of everybody. Right. Everybody's pissing themselves laughing. So... Well, at least I didn't land on my back, but it was embarrassing. Though. I think you had about 25 and 14 yeah. at the time, though. You just had a big finally, one. So it's oh, all good. Well, that's okay then, boys. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. I put in a little work. I put in some work. Hey, you win that championship. Obviously, you beat the Magic on their home court, and then things change around. And then 12 months later, like, back to back. Like, you, you mentioned before about, you know, straight up, got along well. You and Darnell have that you know, relationship and friendship. The motivation to go back to back. How strong was it in those days to be able to solidify you as, as as the best team of that particular time in the NBL? Because to go back to back had been proven to be very hard in the last decade or so outside of the Wildcats. Look, we wasn't thinking about back to back. Um, we were just thinking we we enjoyed the moment of winning. Um, I remember sitting in our hotel rooms for the for game we were with the game three in Melbourne. And they showed videos of uh, was it was it the Magic? Mm -hmm. it was the Magic doing drills with Coach Gordon? Now Coach Gordon is one of the best ever do it, and it's great that he's back in the league because it just brings a lot of credibility to the league, and it's going to help out that that region of the Hawks with a lot of pride. So it's great to see him not only back but over there. It's going to bring a big boost to that area to the league. But he works he works his players, he works them. And him and Phil smile like chalk and cheese, man. So we're sitting up there, and they are doing defensive slides, right, in the playoffs, right before game three of the championship. And we're sitting up there watching like, man, do you see this? <laughs> it's like, how, do, how are they going to have legs for game three? And right away, something clicked, you know. But that's what they done. They hung their hat on the fact that we work harder than anyone else in the league. That's, mm. That was a character that was in makeup. And then we're sitting up there, you know, eating chips and drinking sodas. Like, <laughs> man, they, they won't be able to keep up with us tomorrow, man. They won't be able to keep up with us, right? So we ran and ran and ran and we ended up winning it. Now, mm. we look back at the game, the shooting percentages were horrible. Horrible. But we still won by 26 points or something. Mm. So the next year, we weren't thinking back to back. We just wanted to get back out there and play. Now, we did know that we wouldn't be sneaking up on anyone. With you defending champ, bullseye squirrel on your back. So we need to be better. And I remember we started off kind of slack. We probably was had a little bit too much swagger, right? And I remember Phil started to cut back on certain things. So mm -hmm. we started to tighten up on things and training. All right? Because our trains were always a bit loose. You know what I mean? But he just started to make a couple little changes just to get our attention a little bit. All right? And then after I think about that third or fourth game, we started to refocus and we started to hit our straps again and then off we went but it it wasn't about first you know trying to go back to back it was just once again we're in the moment you know we just wanted to go out there and, and, and win and provide some entertainment and we had a bit of player and we enjoyed it especially playing at home man at the powerhouse back those days was rocking you know that place was rocky man and we had people hanging off the rafters standing up and you know, that's that's a big reason you play the game, man. You get to in front of that crowd 
and you there to put on the show and entertain and, and do your thing, it's, it's exciting. I mean, I, I miss that, you know? I miss that. That's a big part of the game. And so I never – I always liked the way Scottie Pippen played. Mm. Scottie always played with, a, like, a bit of a smile on his face. You know, he was – looked like he was enjoying himself. And I remember watching that, and I liked that. I, I kind of picked up on that. And that's kind of the way I wanted to be. I wanted to be out there. I engaged the crowd a little bit here and there and have fun. People are coming from their work and parts of their lives, and they're paying money to watch you play. And they want to get out there, enjoy themselves, give the referees a little bit of grief, give the opposition team a little bit of grief. But, you know, they want to see you out there putting on a show and entertaining. And that's something that I really bought into probably a little bit too much at times. But I did, and I enjoyed it. And so, and that's what we've done. So that back-to-back -back was tougher. It was tougher. We had more people coming at us. Uh, some teams have gotten better and whatnot. But we managed to, we managed to get it done. Uh, Brett Maher stepped up during the playoffs. He ended up winning the MVP I wanted to, to get before. So. And Mazi ended up winning it. Uh, you know, his confidence at that time was, man, he was tough. He was playing well. He had to go up against Darnell every day. Mm. And let me tell you, Donnell did not take it easy on him. Mozzie was very, and still is to this day, very competitive. But Donnell used to strip the ball from him. <laughs> he used to take the ball, he used to block his shot. And Mozzie used to go off, <laughs> right? Mozzie used to go off. But, you know, tribute to Mozzie, he just stuck with it and he got better. Mm. He got better. He started getting better ball handling skills. He started being great, not just being a spot shooter. And all of a sudden, boom, he was off and going as well. For, for where you and Darnell were at in your lives and your careers at that point, was Phil the perfect coach for you guys at that point? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of Phil's biggest assets was he did not overcoach us. Um, some coaches might want to come in. Like I remember an example, and then, uh, Donnell called me one day when he played for Wollongong Hawks. Now, my friend of Joyce was one of the best coaches ever played. So, shout out to Joyce and Dan. But I remember when he first got there, first of all, I couldn't believe that he went and played for Wollongong after they beat us in that final. That's a different story. I'm glad you didn't bring that up. We'll leave that alone. <laughs> but he went to play for Joyce and the Hawks, and Joyce was trying to kind of teach Donnell how to play defense. Now, we know defense was his thing. Mm. So I remember Donnell calling me on the phone, man, and he's like, I can't believe he trying to teach me how to play on defense and play the yeah, And he tried to teach me how to play defense. Donnell was going on, and I'm just sitting there listening like, yeah, that's probably not the best thing to do. Now, it's not that Joyce couldn't teach him something, but right. we kind of felt at that time that maybe he was trying to overcoach him a little bit in regard to defense when you know the guy had already had, I don't know how many people put this, but he got there. So I think Coach ended up figuring it out. And he kind of backed off a little bit. And then that was the end of it. And Donnell just was Donnell. So with Phil, he allowed you to do what you do best. He was always very positive by being positive for one another and positive in the locker room. And he had he, had, he was great for veteran players. Mm -hmm. All right. Now for the younger players, sometimes we got younger players who came in later on, like a young Oscar forward and those guys. So it became tough for them because they came in and saw how we done things and they thought they could do it that way. Right. So you know, we had to kind of say to them, hey, look, you know, you need to work a little bit harder and get here before, train out, get your shots up, do everything you do. But we earned the right to be sitting up here shooting shots like this and shit. You know, we earned the right to do that. You haven't earned the right to do that yet, young fella. So it was tough for younger players coming in to see us do the things that we do. Um, and that was something that kind of, manifested itself a little bit more later on, but he was a perfect coach. He was a coach, I think, voted that most players would like to play for. Uh, and for us, we just loved it because we knew we was going to go get out there and play. He wasn't going to overtrain us, so we weren't worried about blowing out our legs or anything before games or anything. And during the course of the season, we were fresh or fresher than a lot of teams going down into the playoffs, you know, because he would back off a little bit and modify trainings. And you got to understand, the guy played the game. He played in like four Olympics or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's unbelievable. That's what, 16 years right there? And he played four Olympics? I mean, you know, Phil was a hell of a player. And he used to get out there and train with us too every now and then. Oh, yeah? You can see that 
you can see it. Okay, yeah, I understand why he was in the Olympics. He can play. He just he ran the team. They called him the general for a reason. He was quick. He was very smart. He understood the game. Um, and uh, him and SJ were chalk and cheese as well. They were they were funny, man. It's like Oscar Felix, man. They were a funny ass coaching staff, but uh, they let us play. And, and, and did Steve did Brady it. get out there and practice with you as well? <laughs> Who SJ? Yeah. Man, let me tell you, Steve, get out there with those knock knees now, man. He, <laughs> he he would get out there and shoot a few jump shots every now and then. But man, our team was like a it was like a comedy tour at times because Steve and Paul Reese have history from the Giants, right? Mm -hmm. So Steve was Brett Brown's assistant coach. And so him and Reese would just go at it all day, just taking the piss out of each other. And the big fella, I don't know if you guys know the big fella. He is hilarious. Mm. Reese is hilarious to this day. And so our training sessions, I wish you could have seen them, man. They were unique. Mm. They were unique, man. You know, they were totally different. But we made it work, and we certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Now, Cam, I just want to ask a quick question about Donnell. We're talking about Donnell there. KB, you've been around this league for a long, long time. Is Darnell me or Damian Martin the best defensive player this league's ever seen? Man, that's an easy one for me. Now, obviously, I'm a bit biased. I played with Darnell. I didn't play with Anthony Lloyd, but I've seen Damian Lloyd come up. For me, it's Darnell. Uh, Darnell could not only defend that point guard position, he could defend about three positions. Darnell was the best player on our team. He was a better player than I was. Now, I can mention that now. I've gotten a little bit older and stuff like that back in the day. I probably <laughs> wouldn't have, but he was. Donnell could have averaged 25 points a game. Easy. And still played defense and still went out and got five, six, seven rebounds. He could have played the two because he started off as a two. He was the best player on that team all around playing. You know what I mean? But he played his role and he done it well and he enjoyed it. He was, he was, a, Brett Meyer was the captain, but Donnell was the leader. Okay, so when I look at Damien, Damien's tough. Damien's the type of player where you put him in the middle, you build around him. He's in room, and he is definitely going to be obviously a Hall of Fame player for this league. He's been awesome. I think he just retired. But when I look at both of those players, and I've only played with one, I've, I know, I've seen them. I think Darnell could have done more defensively in different positions. I think overall, I think he was a better, smarter player. I'm not saying that Namo wasn't, but um, I think that he was better. But like I said, I'm, I'm probably a little bit biased. Did you catch that they've, they've named the trophy after Damo? You know what? Um, I'm going to tell you a quick little story now. I had a chat with Donnell about three, four years ago, and Donnell told me that that was going to happen. He said, as soon as he gets more defensive player of the year awards than I do, and they're going to name that trophy after him. And, uh, and so it has happened. Kudos to Damo. Congratulations for that. That's quite an honor. And, uh, but we did see it coming. I haven't talked to Donnell about it right uh, lately. I actually talked to Donnell a couple of days ago. I don't really think I'm going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> we, might send him the clip, <laughs> we might send him the clip of you saying he was a better player. We might, he might need to see that. Hmm. Hey, he's going to agree with that. He knows. Donnell was tough, man. He was tough. Hashtag NBL Rewind to get involved. Now, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing at the moment. You've got your business, of course, uh, right behind you there. Tell us how it's all going and, and if people want to get involved. How are you, how are you all tracking at the moment? Well, man, you know what? Look, I finished up with the Sixers in April. Uh, applied for the head job. I didn't get it. So it's like something out of Friday, like Smokey said, you got you, you have a job, you have shit to do. So for the moment, I was just like, okay, what I'm gonna do here, you know? And uh, you kind of be thrown right back in that situation where you're in transition. But I think that uh, the beauty is that I started my business almost three years ago. So I'm doing what a lot of guys are doing. It's a lot of guys out there doing some really good things. They're paying things for it, they're providing a service to the community, especially with the young people. And that's all I'm doing, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, clinics and holiday camps, academies. I'm doing that. I'm looking at possibly getting into school programs. I'm, I'm looking at bringing in some, uh, some shooting machines, shooting sessions, because the shooting is going way down with our young kids. 
they're not shooting the ball well, the percentages are way down because they're not getting enough shots. So they need to get enough quality shots. So I'm doing all these things now. Now I'm in transition, trying to make it a full-time gig. And that's coming along well. Obviously, COVID has changed a lot of things. But as of right now, it's going well, and I think it has the potential to grow. Um, I love to have my own training facility one day. That's what I'm working towards as well. Uh, but, you know, baby steps right now. You know, Brooks Basketball, you can check it out, brooksbasketball.com.au. I also do consultancy, which is, you know, uh, you know, coaching coaches, uh, scouting, video sessions, game strategy, and play evaluation. So that, that kind of keeps me busy in the moment. My golf game is going way down, boys, way down. <laughs> You know, because now I got like a real job. Like, you know, I got to be hustling, man. And uh, so my golf game is suffering big time. Is your phone <laughs> is your phone still on for NBL clubs? Is my phone still? Like, obviously didn't get the job, the head job, yes. at, the head yes. coaching job at Adelaide. Yes. But if teams want to get in touch with you about assistant coaching roles or or roles in the future beyond this season? Like, is that, are you still interested in being a part of the league? Well, I think that I probably wouldn't be interested in any teams out of Melbourne right now, but. We get that. Actually, it's, it's not gonna happen for me, boys. I got a five-year-old, a two-year-old, two boys, and I don't wanna leave my family, I don't wanna leave my boys. So, um, look, I wouldn't say never, but it would probably have to be a really good thing, like a head coaching position or something, uh, because, yeah, I don't want to break my family up. So I already, I already knew that. I knew that Adelaide was a, was a, was a thing for me. I put in 10 years as an assistant, so it's unfortunate that things ended the way they did. I'm sure you guys are aware it got pretty ugly down here in Adelaide. That wasn't good for the league, wasn't good for the club and everyone involved. So I was very disappointed. For everyone, I think that uh, my chances, I became a bit of collateral damage because of some of that. Um, but I understand that they wanted to clean house a bit. They wanted a fresh start. Uh, Connor Henry is coming in here. He's an accomplished coach. He's been coaching, all right? He's done, uh, he's coached here in Australia, but he went back to the States and coached, I think, Gigi, and done very well. I think he's going to be a good coach for the Sixers. And, uh, you know, we just need to get out there and give him all the support that he needs and to get our team up to uh, a place where we can contend for championships again. So there's going to be a whole new staff and everything there. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be a part of it, but I'm going to continue to support my club. Very well said. Hey, mate, it's been an honour as always. We love, Elaine and I have the, uh, the privilege each and every week to go back, watch your game. Everyone gets a seat and to sit down and have a chat to a legend like yourself is always fun reminiscing. We could honestly probably do this for another five hours. Uh, well, Liam and I have got time considering we live in Melbourne, but uh, I know you're hustling. So you got to, we're going to let you I'm go. Hustling, man. I'm hustling, <laughs> hey, we, we appreciate it, man. It's always fun to have a chat and uh, look forward to catching up again real soon. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. And I really appreciate that you actually didn't show that video of that dunk because that's what I thought you was going to do. So I'm glad you didn't do it. Don't do it, Liam. Don't do it, bro. All right? Leave it in the archives, man. We, hey, we've been told. Fair this, enough. No, nah, no. Nah, come on, Cam. No, nah, no. Nah, this thing's got to go through post-production <laughs> before it goes to the people. <laughs> we are going to get out of here, Liam. Thank you. KB has always been a pleasure. NBL overtime next Tuesday. Huge going, huge things going around around the league. But if you ever watch this game, get to NBL TV, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram. Check out the real wherever you get all your NBL content. Hashtag NBL right. Rewind. We'll see you next week.